Uh, uh, so hello everyone, it's a real um, uh, pleasure. I'm slightly, slightly nervous at the prospect of uh, presenting my ideas because as Mark says, I'm taking a, a rather kind of optimistic approach uh, to, to this problem. Right. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about whether subjective scales should be interpreted as cardinal, and I'm going to uh, propose what, what I think is a new hypothesis of how people might interpret subjective scales. I don't think there is currently such a hypothesis. Um, I'll explain how, if, if the hypothesis is right, subjective data will be cardinal, given a further assumption. Um, I'm then going to set out four individually necessary sufficient conditions for cardinality, and I'll explain what happens if you find out they're not met. I'm going to offer a very partial defense of my hypothesis. So there are, there are four conditions, and I'm only going to talk about uh, linearity in the reporting function, uh, not about changing subjective scales over time or across people. Uh, I would do so if I, if I had the confidence but future time, I'm going to be um, disappointing you in not giving you the, the full set of evidence, although I discussed this more in the paper, for those who are very interested. Uh, and then I'm going to close by indicating some further tests that could be done to assess the hypothesis I propose uh, and how this could be used to, to correct self report to make the card as what we want it. Okay, so uh, background, which I'm sure will be uh, uh, familiar to, um, I'm sure will be familiar to, uh, uh, to all of us. Um, we ask people using subjective scale, we ask people for numer numerical ratings of subjective phenomena, e.g., happiness. From zero to ten scale, there are disagreements over what I'm going to call the cardinality thesis. So, does a one point reported change on a given scale represent the same change in the subjective phenomenon at hand, whatever it is, to different people at different times? Um, I can see the chat flashing occasionally, Alberto, but I don't. Uh, but so, just in interject me if it's uh, if it's important. Um, uh, yeah. So, um, it'd be really inconvenient if if the data we had were well, it just represented a ranking without conveying information about the underlying uh, magnitude changes in what we're measuring. Uh, we say things at the moment like you know, the, the life satisfaction of the French is seven and that of the Germans is eight. Um, but if the data are ordinal, we can't say this. And if what we want to do is say increase the sum total of, uh, of happiness or life satisfaction, then we need our data to be, to be cardinal as well. So I think this is sort of the elephant in the room. There's quite a lot of stake. Um, as far as I can tell, opinion seems a bit divided on disciplinary lines. Psychologists are happy with the cardinality thesis. The economists aren't. And Bond and Lang is an example of recent skeptics this latter camp. Um, I haven't been able to find very much literature on this topic. Um, here, here are some notable exceptions. But um, yeah, I, I thought there would be more on this than there seems to be. So perhaps just fall in between the interdisciplinary gaps. So are these concerns about the cardinality thesis justified or not? Well, there are two places you might jump off. You might, um, as sort of Tyler was suggesting earlier, you might uh, question whether there's phenomenal cardinality. So is the subjective state we're interested in perceived in units of intensity? So does it make sense to say things like, this hurts me as much as it hurts you, that there's a quantified uh, intensity to these, uh, to these subjective states? And if it doesn't, of course, it's going to be a nonsense to have a cardinal scale of something which is not itself cardinal. But I take it the, the bigger concern is really about scale interpretation. So do people interpret their scales in such a way that when they report their subjective states, their answers end up being cardinal? Um, perhaps we have worries that groups have systematic differences in reporting. Some of that's been alluded to earlier. So in this talk, I'm going to just take the first one for granted, and I'm going to be talking about the second. Um, and as far as I can tell, we don't have a theory of how people try to interpret subjective scales or an account of how they would need to interpret them for uh, the cardinality thesis to hold. And as a result of lacking one and two, it's not been clear how one would really get to the bottom of the story on um, how, to, how to make sense of the data. Right, so what's the problem with subjective scales? If I ask you a very impertinent question, how much do you weigh? That's fairly easy to answer. I ask you in kilograms, it's an objective scale. There's, there's no kind of confusion about how you're supposed to answer the question and what the units mean. But if I ask you um, uh, to give a rating of a subjective uh, phenomenon, so those, those questions are inherently vague. So I ask you, 
how happy are you? And I say zero to 10, very unhappy to very happy. There are some, um, there are some blanks you need to fill in in the scale before you can answer. So you need to decide what the endpoints refer to. How happy is 10 out of 10, very happy? Is it the happiest you've ever been? Is it the happiest anyone has ever been? Is it the happiest it's possible to be? Uh, and you also need to choose your reporting function, how to scale. So Casper discussed that earlier. Is each one unit change on the scale? Does that represent the same change in underlying phenomena or, or, or not? Perhaps each one unit change going up the scale represents a doubling of the underlying sensation. Um, and um, sort of the discussion I've seen so far, Bond and Lang being a prime example, ends up being quite statistical. Um, and I, I sometimes sense I think this is looking at the problem in a uh, in a slightly unfortunate way because what we're, what's really going on here is we're wondering how do people use language. So what we need is a theory of how people are trying to use language. Um, at the moment, I think we have one. So quoting Kroger, Krug, a Stone, and Kruger, who are sort of summing up some methodological problems with objective well-being. They say in order to have more concrete ideas about the extent to which differences in scale interpretation may be a problem should have a better idea of why such differences exist in the first place and have some theoretical justification for concerned systematic differences and how subjective well-being questions are interpreted and answered. So I'm going to uh, offer one. So here's some background thinking. Uh, comes from Paul Grice, who's a philosopher of language, that conversation is a cooperative endeavor governed by various norms. Uh, languages are kind of how, how um, and there are various kind of ways in which we uh, understand how to use language, try to be truthful, get no more and no less information required to be relevant and to be clear. So, um, when, so, so when we communicate, we are trying to convey information to each other. And what we can take from this is that, uh, just like when I ask you, you know, where are you going tomorrow or how are you, we're making some inferences about what you want to hear. Um, we can expect that if we ask people, how do you feel, zero to 10, they will try and understand what's going on in that conversation and try to answer, uh, try to answer the question in a way which conveys the, the information that they think that we want. So we can expect people to try and give us useful information. Um, but the issue as noted is that there are different ways to interpret subjective scales, and you don't know how other people are going to answer those. But what you're going to want to try and do is to try and give information. Um, in, in what you're going to try and want to do is to give information uh, in the same way as other people so that your seven out of 10 means the same thing as someone else's seven out of 10 so that, so that your answer makes sense to the, the surveyor. So if I know that my two out of 10 uh, means something different from how I expect everyone else to answer, then I'm not being very helpful in answering the question in my kind of obtuse bespoke way. And so this is kind of violating the, the norms of conversation. Um, but the challenge is we don't know what other people are going to do. So um, this is you know, moving from philosophy to economics. Uh, I think we can understand the challenges of scale interpretation as, as, a, as a search for a shelling point or a focal point, a, do, a default solution picked in the absence of communication. So here's the classic example of a shelling point. If you're going to meet a stranger in New York, you can't communicate with the person, where and when will you choose to meet? And so when Schelling uh, uh, asked his, his students this, he found that, that most people said they would meet at noon at Grand Central Station in the information field. And the idea is we have some idea of how to coordinate with other people, even if we can't communicate with them. And this is how I think we should kind of conceptualize the problem of scale interpretation, given the, the vagueness of the question. Okay, so that's the kind of the general framework I'd encourage you to take. I um, don't think anyone's proposed this before. But then we need a kind of a more specific hypothesis about what people are actually going to do. You know, are they going to meet at Trump Tower or are they going to meet at Grand Central Station and so on? So the specific hypothesis is this, when individuals are asked to rate the value of a subjective state and given a limited number of options, e.g. a zero to 10 scale, they will use a linear reporting function so that each point on the report scale represents the same change in magnitude. And they will interpret the top and bottom of the scales as respectively lowest highest value the state takes in practice. So a 10 out of 10 for happiness is uh, the happiest you can expect anyone else being asked a survey question to, to answer. Okay, so uh, why is this? 
Well, the first one I think is a bit more obvious. Um, you know, we, we're used to using uh, equal interval scales in, in normal life. Uh, we use them for things like weight and height and money and so on. So, you know, we're more familiar with those logarithmic scales or, or other types. And the other one, why would, why would people choose the realistic limit? Um, I think it helps to consider the alternative. So I might think, okay, 10 out of 10 for happiness. Do I mean the happiest it is logically possible to be? Well, there is no logical limit to happiness, so that doesn't make sense. What about if I use the nomological limit, the limits within the laws of nature as they are? Well, you know, shucks, I don't know what the nomological limit on happiness is. Um, and then it can be difficult to take a scale which is too short. So if I use 10 out of 10 to be the happiest I've been, but I expect other people are happier than this, but I will be happier tomorrow than I am today, then I'm gonna to have to change my scale. And if I'm trying to be helpful and understand and answer questions the way that, that I think other people will, if I use the real limit, then I can use the same scales over time and not have to change my answers and um, have those to be the same as uh, what other people use. So with, so we're sort of playing, the idea is that in this case, just like other cases of conversation, we have a sense of what other people's minds are doing. We're doing some, some subconscious processing. So none of this needs to happen consciously for it to be plausible. So a couple of observations. If people do report in this way, then the cardinality thesis will hold, assuming there's phenomenal cardinality. So if there's a linear reporting function, that means each person at a time has a cardinal scale, and if different people and at different times are using the scale to refer to the same, uh, the same uh, magnitudes of, of experience, uh, the realistic limit, then basically everyone is using the same scale. And this allows us to make another observation, which is that people sometimes object to sub subjective scales being a bounded measure of something that is in fact unbounded. So, you know, why can't I say I'm 11 out of 10 happy? But on this case, it, on this account, subjective scales are not realistically bound. I mean, the reason, I mean, you could logically be 11 out of 10 happy, but you can't be realistically be 11 out of 10 happy. That's because we, we set up our scales so as to um, encompass all the possibilities. So this is just a kind of a hypothesis, a way that, a way that people might be trying to do things. Uh, people can still fail, even if they try it, um, and different people might have, you know, Different people might uh, might not try to do this, but this is this is I think this is pretty plausible as an account of, of what might be going on. So that's the the story. We can now specify kind of the four individually necessary and jointly sufficient conditions for the cardinality thesis. So the first one is phenomenal cardinality, which is the underlying subjective state. Say subjective well-being have a cardinal structure. Is it perceivable in units? And then there are three more which relate to scale interpretations. The first is linearity. There are linear relationships between self-reported and actual subjective being or, or whatever subject that you're interested in. Intertemporality uh, for different people, for each individual. Do the top and bottom represent the same magnitudes across time? And this covers the full range of possibilities. And then for interpersonality, it's essentially the same as intertemporality. It's, you know, are you covering the the realistic limits and only the realistic limits of whatever is uh, being used. Okay, so um, that might be a bit unintuitive. So kind of in, in layman's terms, the different conditions are, uh, one, can we have a measuring stick at all, the thing we're interested in. Second one, are the marks on our measuring stick evenly spaced? Um, as a, as a non-economist, I've had to make this all simple enough that I can understand it, so this is my effort to do so. Uh, do we have the same length um, sticks over time uh, and interpersonality, the different people use the same length of measuring stick. So these are the different conditions. And this allows us to, to then make, make some observations about what happens if these conditions don't obtain. Okay, so I said like, here are four individually necessary and jointly sufficient conditions. What happens if we don't get them? Well, as noted already, if C1 fails, the game's over. If the thing we're interested in isn't cardinal in its nature, then of course you can't have a cardinal measure. But interestingly, with the rest of the conditions, these can all fail by degree. So, you know, our, our measuring sticks might be slightly different length, such that, you know, to the first approximation, they're the same length, or they might be very different lengths, in which case, you know, we should really be, be concerned um, and you know, maybe throw away our, our, our data. Um, 
Uh, and uh, I think it's already been noted that um, uh, for these conditions about scale interpretation, if, if there's random variation, uh, then this will just wash out classical measurement error. Uh, so the concern is about non-random deviation. So as Casper mentioned, you know, do, do rich people in fact interpret their scales in this way because they're rich? Um, okay, so how can we, is there something useful we can say? Can we assess these conditions? This is all ineradicably subjective. So differences in reported numbers might be the actual differences or differences in reporting or some com combination of the two. Um, and there seems to be this sort of skepticism that, you know, because it's all subjective, we should throw our hands up, treat all hypotheses as every probable. But that's, that's much too quick. We can use various assumptions we have to try and assess these options. So uh, the first condition I've taken for granted, uh, the, the last two I don't have time to go into. I can discuss them if someone from me uh, would like me to discuss them. But here I'm just going to present information regarding linearity to sort of uh, show how uh, to show it in this to show in this case how I think the uh, the, the chips lie and how one kind of uh, tries to do the assessment using assumptions. Okay, so uh, what we what we kind of want for there to be cardinality is there's a linear relationship between self-reported and actual subjective state. Uh, and of course we don't give people a con continuous um, continuous set of responses, but the idea is that sort of for the first approximation is people pick the nearest response, uh, this ends up being kind of on average uh, a linear relationship, even if uh, uh, e even if the, there aren't a limited, but even if there are, uh, it's not it's given a continuous reporting. So what else uh, might we do? So Casper mentioned a couple of possibilities uh, earlier. Um, uh, one possibility is sort of logarithmic relationship where the um, where each increase or each one point reported increase is is causing a larger amount of actual change. And then there's this kind of other option suggested by um, Yu Kang and G that uh, there might be this arc tangent relationship. And the sort of thought here is that um, that uh, you want to kind of in the normal range of functioning, it's more or less straight. But then when you kind of get to the end of the scale and run out of room, you then compress more information in. And this idea is that this scale allows you to represent all of the logical possibilities. So I think there's some evidence uh, uh, supporting the, the linear function. I'll, I'll cite three bits. So one is that when, um, when you ask subjects to give a subjective measure of something objective, they seem to use a linear scale. So this is from Andrew Oswald, who asked people to say how tall did they think they were on a, on, a, on a zero to 10 scale, and then measured how tall they were. And you can see there's a pretty good uh, relationship. So people are, seem to be inferring a subjective scale of an objective thing as being approximately linear. Um, another piece of evidence comes from Van Prague, who if you give people ordered verbal labels, you can see them written there, and then put the, and then ask them to put them onto a cardinal scale. They put them at approximately uh, equidistant from each other. So that's an, kind of an, another indication. And this one is a, is a bit more technical, but I think is quite powerful, um, which is about the homoscedicity of, uh, of errors. So Kruger and Schick and Schade asked people, uh, did some uh, test retest of reported net effect uh, a, a week apart. Okay, and what are we expecting to, to see here? So if you assume further that um, if you're very happy or unhappy, uh, the change in your net effect will be will vary by about the same week to week. So expect that the, the changes are kind of the same up and down the scale. Further, if people are using a linear reporting function, what you should expect to see in the test, retest, uh, um, uh, uh, data is that the the differences are about, are about kind of uh, the the changes in net errors are about the same at different points in the scale, and this is kind of roughly what we do see as well. Um, so to kind of if you you could have an alternative hypothesis to this, so let's say you, you thought there was a logarithmic reporting function, but that you still expected that the week by week change in happiness would be about the same regardless of how happy you were. What you would expect to see 
given there was a logarithmic proportion function, was that the differences um, uh, for the people who were, who were happiest would be very, very tiny. And the people who were less happy would be spread out enormously because the absolute units of happiness are much higher um, the further up the, uh, the scale you go than, than further down. But this isn't what we see. So this is kind of a case when we use inference as the best explanation to choose between different hypotheses. So I think the evidence is pretty good that there's, a, there's, there's linearity. Um, and but for reasons of time, I'm not going to go into the other one. But I think there's, there's something more or less uh, similar to say in those cases. And then returning to the shelling point hypothesis, the challenge with the, um, uh, if, you, if you think, well, you know, maybe people do use a nonlinear function, is that there are all kinds of nonlinear functions you could use. So going back to, um, going back to the R tangent relationship, you know, there are all types of kind of levels of curvature you could have. So if you think I'm going to use an arc tangent to report my happiness, but I want the report, the, the surveyor to understand my answer, well then, you know, you basically, you can't really expect that the surveyor is going to know what your kind of bespoke report hunting function is. So in the terms of the shelling point hypothesis, it seems less likely that people can do that. So we have some kind of reason for thinking one way rather than another. Okay, so that's all I'm going to do in terms of the evidence, um, unless people push me for more. I'm now going to sort of more or less wrap up. So I think some tests which would be interesting to do, which haven't yet been done, would be to more directly try and test which reporting functions people use and what they take the endpoints to be. I know we're going to discuss some of this uh, tomorrow. So one option would be you give people diff different options for, for these things and then ask them you know, which of these different options is most similar to how you think you do it. So you ask someone whether 10 out of 10, you know, do they think that's most like the happiest they've ever been, the happiest they could ever be, the happiest anyone alive could ever be, and so on. And that would give us some indication of what, of what you know, people do. And another option would be to infer the choices from behavior. So um, you could present a different range of, uh, of scale endpoints to, to people, or to different individuals, uh, including some without any label, and then ask them to give their own range from the scale. You know, how happy are you on the scale which where 10 is the happiest you've ever been? And how happy are you on the scale where 10 is the happiest anyone could ever possibly be? And then, um, uh, and then, so that it would be then interesting to compare uh, those different those different options. And then the if a scale which was left un, unlabeled, i.e., just zero to ten, the answer that was most similar to the unlabeled scale is presumably how people intuitively uh, label scales when they're not when they're not prompted to do so. Um, and then, uh, so there's this kind of uh, further and final thought: that you know, what happens if we learn that our our, our data aren't cardinal. Well, uh, I pointed out that if you accept there's phenomenal cardinality, your data can be more or less cardinal by manner of, by sort of matter of degree. They can go wrong in a particular way. And if you know how the kind of the particular way in which they go wrong, the sort of way you've identified using some of the tests you just mentioned, you can then correct them. You know how, you know, how much, how, how, uh, how the measuring stick has gone wrong, you can say what it should be. Um, so we can, we know what's gone wrong. We can then correct the raw data so that correct so that the transformed data um, will be will be cardinal in the way that we want. So you know, if we knew that some individuals used a specific logarithmic reporting function, we could then receive a mathematical transformation of their data, and then it would be interpretable cardinal. Okay, so that's where I'm going to uh, to finish. I don't know how I'm doing for time. Um, so there are long-standing doubts over this. Cardinality thesis, how do we make sense of the data? Um, but it's a bit unclear if they're, if they're justified. You, can, you could doubt phenomenal cardinality, or you could have concerns about scale interpretation. I've offered uh, you know, an optimistic, perhaps like naively so, hypothesis of scale interpretation and how that does lead in general to subjective data being cardinal, because in short, that's what people are trying to do. Specify some of the conditions. I've defended just one of the conditions. And then I've indicated some directions for further research. I welcome uh, comments and questions.